morning. Life is breaking and blessing. Life is breaking and blessing. These days, everything seems to be converging for me. I don't know if you ever get to that place in life where everything has meaning. It's hard to sustain this place, but you can look around and smell the roses and see the colors and see how it all beautifully blends together, the tapestry. But then on the other side of that, you think about those existential questions. Do I live in a universe that is this dualistic struggle between good and evil? Or is this a place where those complementary forces actually need each other? Do I believe that the ultimate force, there is an ultimate force that conspires for ultimate good? Well, who knows? But I believe that that gravitational pull, that there is a gravitational pull, and that it pulls at our soul daily. It's always tugging at us, trying to help to guide us toward our own freedom. It wants us to manage our own traumas and triumphs, which can sometimes be scary, but it's a growth process. And in, its, in this growth process, we change. When things get rough, our hope, our hope can't always flow like water. But what we want to do is flow like the starlings, to flow like that school of fish, leaning in, leaning in, and stepping away when we need to. The truth is that we need contrast in life. I'm not talking about drama. Nobody wants drama. Some people actually, I think they like drama. <laughs> but, but contrast. Contrast. We need action. We need something to get us moving. That's karma. Karma is action. For better or for worse, it's action. And we need action. Action keeps life vital. It leads us to new adventures that take us away from our packs. But then we come back to our people that we love, our communities. We bring that new knowledge with us and the whole is made better. We flow into community, but we also flow out of community. That's our individuality. But we come back because we know there's a communal responsibility so there's freedom with accountability. To be accountable means to have responsibility to the whole. In biomimicry, this is easy to see with other organisms. Some are very independent, but many are swarms and colonies of unified participation. They go out to support the queen, if they're bees. Look closely and you will see hibernation participation. This beautiful dance, you will see the yin and the yang, the soft and the hard. And it's complimentary. So perhaps God can be complimentary and dualistic. God contains all contradictions and paradoxes. That's what I think God is. What do you think God is? I think God is that, but I also believe God is energy. And I think God is the dark energy in space that scientists can't seem to figure out what it is. One day they will, and they're going to discover that it is consciousness. 
It is consciousness pervading, pervading the very aspect and hearts of what we do, the air we breathe. It is everything. And what's going to happen to science when they realize that? I don't know if you know, but there's actually more dark energy and dark matter than actual visible matter. 72% dark energy, 23% dark matter, 5% is just the stuff we see. So it makes sense, makes sense to me. I think God, life, love, energy is consciousness. It is pure awareness. In other religions like Hinduism, God or that energy is called prana. In Chinese philosophy, it is chi. In Japan, ki. Or if you are a Native American in the Lakota tribe, it was called wakan. The Greeks called it pneuma. Christians call it the Holy Spirit. It is that vital life force that waxes and wanes, wax on, wax off, Daniel. Remember that from the movie, The Karate Kid? That was a lesson. Get with the flow, inside, outside, above, below, down, up, horizontal, vertical. This is yin and yang energy. It contracts and it expands. And yet it appears to me to be pulling us forward towards some better version of ourselves. And even though it is hard to maybe accept this because we have so much justice making work to do, it's there. That lesson is there. Love is inevitable. I said this energy was pulling us forward and pulling us is the perfect word. Josh Long has a song called, talking about the universe is pulling, the force is moving to a greater world. That's the idea. In fact, when I was studying near-death experiences, NDEs, uh, people who were clinically dead say that when they came back, they could feel a force pulling them back into their body. Likewise, as they were leaving their body, they could feel a force pulling them from their bodies. Hundreds of people have, have said this. So there's some bit of truth to this, this gravitational pull, this tug that we feel, it's nearly irresistible. And it's pulling us to something better. Unitarian Minister James Freeman Clark said, we progress onward and upward forever. And I prefer onward and outward forever, like the universe expanding outward, but contracting like a womb giving birth. This has become a living principle for me, that I, you, we, as an organism are being continuously birthed, birthed into a greater version of ourselves. I was watching this incredible six-part series on Netflix. The show is called Amend with Will Smith as the host. It's about the 14th Amendment, which is supposed to be about equal protection under the law of U.S. citizens and how human rights in the United States, well, we still have a lot of work to do. We've come a long way, but we still have a lot of work to do. But the show was fantastic. You can see that rough ride it's been toward freedom and how the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, have been key in securing protections for minoritized groups. The show provides a fresh perspective into the struggle for personhood humane beingness for black folks 
and all others and all of the legal ramifications. Incidentally, I need to mention what happened with the lawmakers in Georgia with that voter suppression. It's just atrocious. It's clear that racism is now in clear sight and they don't even care. So the struggle continues, but the program shows this progress from black Americans who've come over through slavery and then an episode shows the struggle for women's rights, mostly women's suffrage. And then it moves on from there to the struggle for GBLTQAI rights, their freedom, to the emergence of black women rights and Black Lives Matter, and finally ending with the new arrivals to this country, our brown immigrant sisters and brothers. It seems that even though our founding fathers were slaveholders, they had some foresight. There was something wholly brewing inside that helped to set this course, this destiny toward freedom. But what was that inside our fun founding fathers if it wasn't the prana, the all, that is tugging us to evolve? We progress and process, and it's not linear. We go backward, we go forward, we go three steps forward and two steps back or one step back. We go in cycles patterns, those energetic forces moving and conspiring to evolve us. What's my point? In my heart, I am a universalist. And I believe that all are destined for greatness. However horrible it appears. And in that destination, we all advance at many different paths, at many different rates of speed, many different paces is the word I'm looking for. Therefore, we are at many differing stages of faith. Universalism in the traditional sense says that all are saved. I want to reinterpret that and say that all are destined to that beloved community because like a magnet, spirit draws all things unto itself. And that's hard to say given the violence we hear and we witness. We know more than ever how connected we are. What we do impacts others. But don't forget that as some things get worse, many things get better. And we have to acknowledge this. I have to acknowledge this for my own sanity. I have to remember that there are a million bad things happening, but there are also a million good things happening at the same time. Will I ignore the bad stuff? No, that would be shallow. But I do have a choice in how I balance my energy my awareness to what I experience. And that's self-care. That's self-love. Back to my point, the theologian uh, James Fowler, he agreed with me. He said, we have six stages of faith that if we are religious or spiritual or people, that we move through them in our understanding of the self and others, and put that slide up. It starts with the primal or undifferentiated stage, it's stage zero. And then we move to the intuitive, projective, and then to the mythical, literal fundamentalism. Then to a synthesis of what we have learned, a sort of loosening of that li literalness. And then we move toward a more autonomous or individual understanding of the self and those around us. We have this ability to be reflective. We begin building our own theology, BYOT. And then there's a conjunctive stage, bringing things together and finally ending with universalizing. 
what I call integrated spirituality. And herein lies the problem with building a any any beloved community. We don't always know how to be in community because many are in differing spaces on their faith journey. And that's why I like to say you got to meet people where they are. Because people move when they want to move. There's an old saying, a person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. I believe humans should end up at universalism and integration, where they can manage paradoxes and ambiguity and differing perspectives without becoming apathetic and uncaring or judgmental. And it takes a lot of work and patience, of course. But I do, do believe it is our destiny. Mystic philosopher Ken Wilber, who created an integral theory of everything, said that he believes people evolve from me focused to us focused to all of us focused in other words egocentric to ethnocentric to world centric and then to integrated that's the goal integration martin luther king said that he was talking about a a different kind of integration but that's the goal integration Something is pulling us all toward our freedom. And as it pulls us, it is not a yoke. It's not a burden. It's a privilege. It's a responsibility. It's more of a harness. It's helping us to be the best version of ourselves. And when you sort of stop resisting the thing that's pulling you at your stage of faith and lean into it, you begin to see that all of us at some level are enslaved spiritually or mentally or physically, that we all need more freedom. Listen to that tug. And if you are seeking an integrative approach in life, this becomes clear. So I, I go into the world as an individual, representing myself, but also more than myself. Then I bring that knowledge and wisdom back to the whole because we are one. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. That's reciprocity. The writer here isn't just talking about rich versus poor but rather about the universal nature of prana and our interconnectedness. When I don't honor my connection to the whole, the group suffers, I suffer. Solomon Burke said, he's a, he's a blues singer, a soul singer. He said in his vernacular, none of us are free if one of us is chained. None of us are free. And it's not perfect English, but the idea is quite perfect. So if you are like me and trying to be integrated, then you are in all the stages of faith at once, but very aware of the many imbalances in life. The key is awareness and trust. Of, of your process. The energy I've been speaking of this morning waxes and wanes, just like the moon. And so it's telling us that we have to dance with it and give others the space to dance with it. And we dance by making space for differences. We dance by keeping an open mind. We dance by forgiving. We dance by fighting for justice, but also by taking care of ourselves. Last week, I discussed those traumatic dragons that we drag around with us in our relationships. They keep us from growing. They keep us from being free. 
I want to put that list up for you to look at again. Dr. Daniel Amin and his wife, Tana, they wrote a book about it. It's on your screen. They run the Amen Clinics. And there is one in Washington, D.C., by the way, where they have done brain scans of thousands of people and found out that head trauma causes life trauma and vice versa. So they're using a holistic approach in finding cures for people's anxiety and depression. In their new book, they list major and minor dragons for the sake of time. Let's look at these eight major dragons that they identify. I'm not going to go into them. It's just something for us to contemplate. Abandoned, invisible, or insignificant dragons, inferior or flawed dragons, anxious, wounded dragons, should and shaming dragons, special, spoiled, entitled dragons, responsible dragons, angry dragons. True liberation, my friends, starts with responsibility and accountability. Owning the part of the story, that's yours. The work, that's yours. We want this planet to be free, amen. We have to do our part. We wish for a generation to, to live without abuse or trauma, to live in a world with peace, liberty, and justice for all, hallelujah. So we have to start somewhere with some person and some people. Why not us? And what would happen if we all decided to go deeper into why we do what we do, why we react the way we react? What if we started supporting others in their quest to tame their dragons? What would happen? What would the collective knowing do to the mass consciousness? Unitarian Universalist Morgan Mead said, huh, we would change the world. That's what she said about this small group of committed individuals. That's who changed the world every time. We can be that small group of committed individuals. If you go back and look in history and study the characters and the tyrants and some of the heroes, the dragons were not tamed. And then they ended up doing a lot of harm as a result. We do less harm when we tame our dragons. Dr. Amen did not say slay dragons. I said that last week, but I want to strike that. He's not asking us to slay the dragon. He used the word tame. And that aligns with the notion of having an integrated spirituality. We still need the tug of war of the dragon to move us forward and keep us connected to others as human beings. But the dragon doesn't have to be an enemy. It can be a supportive and occasionally nagging friend. As Reverend Sean Dennison wrote so well in the reading this morning, he shared that we can have a new kind of space so that that voice is no longer an enemy. What if we didn't call someone or something the enemy? That's the world I dream about. And if you study the dark, the dark energy, the prana, the chi, the ki, it will show you, it, it will show itself to you it will show itself to you. As I close, I just want to talk about commitment very quickly. That's our theme this month. What does it mean to be a people of commitment? Merriam Webster says that commitment is an agreement or pledge to do something in the future or the state or an instance of being obligated or emotionally impelled. Impelled is a cool word. I looked it up. Impelled means to urge or drive forward as if by the exertion of strong moral pressure. 
force. Now here I'm not thinking of force in that dominating fashion, but I'm thinking of force like in Star Wars. God's love, that imminent energy, as it ebbs and it flows, it calls us all forward to be a better version of ourselves. And if we listen to it, it will reveal itself. When we learn better, we do better. So give it a chance if you aren't already. Say yes to your process, wherever you are, whatever stage of faith you may be at. And you will, I tell you, you will taste the sweetness of freedom again and again. Prana, that Holy Spirit energy is driving us all, all onward and upward forever to better days. Trust that force. Trust that impelling. Say yes to it. And then sing, because you know how it feels to be free. Then you'll sing, because you'll know how it feels to be free. Amen.